Welcome. You're listening to Women's Health and Beyond with Dr. David Goslin, the only podcast for women providing a physician's point of view on everything relating to women's health, sexual medicine, and cosmetic gynecology. Get ready to discover the latest and hottest topics in women's health and how they relate to you. Welcome, everyone. This is Dr. David Goslin for another episode of Women's Health and Beyond. Today, we have Sherry Palm. Sherry comes to me, actually, interestingly enough, through LinkedIn. Um, I, she is one of my friends on LinkedIn, and I looked her up, and I was amazed at some of the stuff she was doing. And since it falls right into women's health, I decided to invite her to the show and talk to us about how she started. And she's the founder and CEO of an association for organ prolapse and support called APOPS, A-P-O-P-S. And she's also the author of two books, one, the award-winning book called Pelvic Organ Prolapse, and another one called The Silent Pandemic. And I really like to call it The Silent Pandemic because her and I both agree that it's amazing how many women are afflicted at, with pelvic organ prolapse to some degree, and nobody ever talks about it. And so as a patient and a leading patient advocate, Sherry has spent the latter part of her career basically teaching, informing, and broadening physicians and patients' understanding of prolapse and what can be done to help. Um, she's very well, she said once, and I always keep this in my mind when I talk to patients, there's almost 4 billion women in the world, and 50% of them, plus or minus a little bit, will actually suffer from some form of prolapse, and very few of them will either seek treatment or talk about it. And so welcome to the show, Sherry. We're so happy to have you because I know you have so much information to share with us. Well, thanks so much for the invite to, to participate, uh, Dr. Gosland. I am thrilled to be here and share information with your following today. Well, you're welcome. So why don't we start from the very basics, Sherry, because a lot of our audience um, is most likely going to really relate to our podcast today, but I want to introduce and sort of define what prolapse is. So I'll... I'm going to let you talk. You're such a great international speaker. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what is prolapse? What are some of the signs and symptoms, the basics of it? Okay. Sounds like a good, a good starting point. What occurs with the female body? Um, in that pelvic cavity itself, there's multiple organ systems and they're supported by, by structural tissues. For a variety of reasons, the leading reason being vaginal childbirth, the second leading reason that prolapse occurs is, is menopause, but there's many other causes to, and we'll get into that in a minute, but what occurs is those organs in those systems drop out of their normal positions, down out of the, their place in the pelvic cavity into the vaginal canal and start to push their way toward the outer edge of the vaginal canal and then outside of the vagina. So what happens is women typically experience this bulge of tissue and they may not notice it there at first, they may just initially notice the sensation of, it may feel like they're sitting on a ball, maybe vaginal pressure. Some women experience pain, but eventually their curiosity gets the better of them and they take a handheld mirror and they look to see what's going on down there. And that was the case with me. And they see this bulge of tissue and it looks tumor-like. If you don't know what prolapse is, you've never heard of it before, which is pretty much the status quo for most women. They don't even know this condition exists because it's not talked about out loud they see that lump of tissue and they assume it's a tumor, which puts people into, women into panic mode right away. So just to make sure we're getting all of the symptoms out on the, on the table here, I'm gonna go through a list of symptoms and, and then I won't miss any of them. The vaginal tissue bulge is, is the primary that symptom that occurs. And that's the one that women typically notice first. But also there's urinary incontinence, which people think urinary incontinence is urinary incontinence and it stands alone, but it's often a symptom of pelvic organ prolapse. It can also be just the flip of that, urine retention. You cannot get the pee to come out to save your soul. You have to pee, you want to pee, you sit down, nothing happens. There can be fecal incontinence. Chronic constipation is a very, very common symptom of erectile seal, one of the five types of prolapse. There can be vaginal, rectal, back, or pelvic pain with this condition. There can be vaginal or rectal pressure. 
You could have a loss of intimate sensation. You may have pain with intimacy. And something that occurs relatively regularly with prolapse that I certainly never, had never heard about was tampons push out. So if you've had no problems keeping tampons in throughout the bulk of your menses, and all of a sudden they won't stay in, that's a flag. Something's going on down there and it's the organs that are pushing those tampons back out. So women typically experience maybe one, two, or three of these symptoms in a very pronounced way. And they may have other more subliminal symptoms. They may experience just one of these symptoms, really, really pronounced. It's all over the page because there's five types of prolapse. There's four degrees of severity. And women often experience more than one type of prolapse at the same time. So the symptoms that you're experiencing are going to vary a little bit from woman to woman, depending on what types of prolapse you have. Uh, getting into the causes of prolapse. Again, childbirth is a leading cause of prolapse. And if you dig down into the layers a little bit deeper, pregnancy itself, the pressures that occur during pregnancy toward the end when that baby's bigger inside of you can cause some, some pressure down below and that is a, a bit of a flag. Uh, so well, childbirth is a leading cause. Menopause is cause number two and that's because as your estrogen levels drop, Estrogen is your muscle tissue strength and integrity. And that pelvic floor muscle that sits at the base, it's kind of like a, um, a trampoline that sits beneath your pelvic organs and holds those organs up. They're supported on the top end by, by structural tissues and the bottom end by that pelvic floor muscle, the PC muscle, it becomes weaker. And as your estrogen depletes when you get into menopause and that estrogen is what's feeding that muscle tissue strength and integrity, those muscles get weaker and the pelvic floor muscle gets weaker and it can't, it's, now it's, it's kind of, let me see if I can do this, you can actually see this, it's like this, it's wussy, it's not firm and tight like this, it's kind of like, like your bicep gets kind of wussy looking after you get older. So those organs aren't held up the way they're supposed to be. Um, heavy lifting is a big causal factor. And when we think about heavy lifting, we tend to think about women that are weight trainers or employment related job where you work in a factory and you're lifting heavy boxes all day, that kind of thing. But if you really think about it a little more deeply, what do women do who have toddlers all day, every day? They're picking up heavy weight with those, with those older babies and, and the toddlers. And if your toddler is sleeping, that's dead weight that you're picking up. So that's heavy lifting as well. Women often have got two or three toddlers running around the house. And so there's you know, compounded by, by numbers of, of how many times you have to pick them up and put them in their high chairs or in a shopping cart or in the car seat or whatever. Women don't know that they should be contracting that pelvic floor muscle to create some structural integrity before they pick that baby up. If you are a fitness junkie, and I am a fitness junkie, I'll say that right up front, I don't run, I don't jog. Every time your foot hits the pavement hard, that hard, that hard foot strike to the ground, you're jerking everything down. And I can't begin to express how many women come into our space that are marathon runners or, or jogging fitness junkies. They love an endorphin rush, but the damage that is occurring because of it is significant. And so we highly encourage speed walking because it's a gentle foot strike to the ground. You're still getting that exercise in, you're still exercising those long muscles. It's a lot safer for you. And there are other fitness activities, obviously, too, that you can engage in that are much safer for your body. Uh, I swear to God, I could stand at the end of a marathon run that's a women's run and just throw pestries out to the crowds of women coming through because I know they're all leaking. I don't think they're leaking. I know they're leaking. Chronic constipation is both a cause of prolapse and a symptom. Of prolapse. So it gets it on both ends. Every time you, you give a rectal seal, one of the five types of prolapse, and you can't poop, you want to poop, and you just can't get that poop to come out. Every time you bear down to have a bowel movement, you're pushing all your organs down, not just the poop. And the poop's not going to come out anyway, usually with a, with a rectal seal. Uh, chronic coughing is, is kind of similar to the, the constipation issues, but with chronic coughing, you're jerking everything down. If you've got emphysema, if you've got allergies, if, if you have, uh, you already have prolapse, but you don't know it, and then you have a bad cold or a flu bug and you're coughing and coughing and coughing for days, and you notice that there's pressure down below, that's a bit of a flag. 
ERA is diastasis flexus abdominis, where that long abdominal muscle splits down the middle. And I, splits not the right word, it stretches down the middle when you're pregnant. And then sometimes after you have the baby, the muscles come back together and sometimes not so much. So you have that gap and you'll notice that kind of scarring tissue look in the long abdominal muscle that creates a core weakness. And so that is a bit of a predisposition to prolapse because you're not getting that core support that you need to have. Genetics, um, your mom's had prolapse, your sister's had prolapse, your grandma's had prolapse. You probably have a, a genetic predisposition to have prolapse as well. Hysterectomy, uh, this is one of those things that it, it's a kind of a slippery slope to talk about because hysterectomy, hysterectomies are very necessary sometimes. I was one of those case in points. I had a hysterectomy on my 40th birthday and I felt better two weeks after surgery with an abdominal incision. I had felt the whole year before that. Adenomyosis, if you've got any kind of a, a uterine cancer issue going on, sometimes hysterectomies are they're just needed. But we're seeing a lot more uh, uterine sparing uh, procedures now with prolapse. With, what happens when they remove that uterus, the mindset kind of is like, you think about a wagon wheel. And the uterus is the hub of that wagon wheel. And, and kind of translate that in, in your mind into a, a wall of soft bricks. And if you remove that soft brick from the middle, what's going to happen? That wall is going to cave in somewhat. So you're shifting those organs. This is a bit of predisposition to prolapsed issues. So we, we don't say never have a hysterectomy. That would be crazy because some women just frankly need them. And sometimes it's what is for a prolapse procedure, if you have uterine prolapse, the uterus is actually removed. So uh, there's many different paths to go with, with uh, uterine prolapse, and I never say never to any of them. Women that have got certain neuro, neuromuscular and genetic diseases are predisposed to prolapse as well. A case in point for me, I have MS, and I watch myself closely. I was told wheelchair-bound prognosis, and that was at my 30th age frame, and I am in my mid-60s now, so obviously I've kept it under control by doing the things that I do. You have a muscle weakness with MS. So any, any genetic uh, neuromuscular disease that you have got um, predisposition to weakness of muscles is going to be a factor for you. Women that are in um, a wheelchair, if you've got spina bifida, that's an issue. They have prolapse issues. If you've got uh, any kind of tissue integrity condition like Ehlers-Danlos, you are predisposed, pre, predis, you're likely to have issues with prolapse. Pardon the, the, the tongue confusion here. Um, we have got a lot of women in our space that have got Ehlers-Danlos. And, and this is a condition that there's 13 types of Ehlers-Danlos. It's a, ge, a genetic tissue integrity weakness. Because there's 13 types, the degree of severity that women have, it is, it's all over the page. But I just spoke to a woman last night who was in her early 70s. And she was she didn't know she had EDS. And she was reading off all of these symptoms that she had. And I was just like, oh, gosh, <laughs> you need to see a geneticist. You know, it, it's, it's, it creates a, a weakness that it not only causes your organs to drop down into your vagina, but it also creates issues for surgery. So you need to see a, a clinician who's really well versed in both EDS, the tissue integrity issues and prolapse as well. So it's kind of, there's a big mishmash of causes here and women often have got more than one causal factor. I had seven, so there's no shock that I had prolapse. So What's important for women to understand is if they're, if they're experiencing prolapse symptoms that they need to see a specialist in this field. Because on the gynecology side, the basic gynecology side, the, the clinicians that you go to for your basic public exams, they're not well versed in these conditions, in these issues. And so you need to see a, a subspecialist that really knows their stuff, a urogynecologist, some of the cosmetic gynecologists dig deeply into this as well. And Seeing those experts is the fast track to getting the best treatment that you possibly can. There's both surgical and non-surgical treatments. You don't have to have surgery ever if you don't want it. But we typically find that women who don't want surgery will go for around two years using a pessary or other types of, of treatments, non-surgical treatments. And at that point, they're like, 
I've had it, just fix it. So uh, I do know a few women who have, have been doing non-surgical treatments for a decade plus, but that's not usually the norm. We, we tend to see more women that eventually they do weave into the, the surgical path. Sherry, let me ask you a question. Sure. <clears throat> First of all, I wanna just clarify to the audience um, that prolapse doesn't necessarily have to be menopausal a menopausal issue. It can, you know, it's, it's very important. It, you know, childbirth, as Sherry well stated, is one of the leading factors. So it's, it's pretty common for patients to come to me after childbearing is over and say, wow, there's so, you know, there's so many changes. You see a, a, a gap inside at the opening of the vagina, which is the first indicator that things have changed. Um, and then, and then you start to examine them and you can appreciate that rectocele, which is a herniation, basically a hernia from the rectum into the vaginal canal. And sometimes an intraseal, which is basically almost the same kind of herniation, just higher up at the apex or the top of the vaginal canal. <clears throat> um, so it's not always a menopausal issue and, and, and something that anybody can be afflicted with. And some women, as you well point out, Sherry, who have genetic predisposition may not even had children before and can suffer from this. The second thing is, and I think it's a myth out there, which is I've had C-sections, so I don't understand why I'm suffering from prolapse. And the thing to understand is that pregnancy in itself can sometimes cause prolapse to occur, even if you didn't deliver the normal vaginal route and, and by C-section. So these are all things to keep in mind for everybody. Sherry, tell us a little bit about, you know, this wasn't, you didn't, you didn't start your life uh, deciding that you wanted to help bring awareness um, to this. So tell us what was the precipitating factor? What, what, what was the, the apex of, of, of what made you come down and realize that this was gonna become your mission in life um, and educate us all? It's funny how, um life changes your flow. Uh, like most women, I had never heard of prolapse before and I had done all the right stuff. I have the MS diagnosis uh, being such a negative prognosis. I did, I crawled my way out of the hole and then I did all the right stuff the rest of my life. I mean, I went in for my routine exams, whether it was breast or, or public exams. I, I was always uh, somewhat of a fitness junkie and, and did the right stuff on, on keeping myself fit. And Fast forward, like I said, I had a hysterectomy on my 40th birthday. I had adenomyosis. I had free radical fibroids. There were actually, there were four things that, that had to be addressed. And so the hysterectomy just made sense. And as I mentioned, I felt better two weeks after abdominal surgery than I had felt for a long time. So that was a real fit for me. But move fast forward then into my mid fifties and I've always worked a 60 hour week. That's just my normal. And I had noticed over the course of about three months that when I would urinate and I would wipe after I would urinate, I could feel a, a bump down there. But I work a 60 hour week, you know, so I rush in the bathroom and I would do my thing and I'd wipe and I think, hmm, what's that? And I would pull my pants up and I'd be on my way. And after about three months of doing that, one day I thought, what is that? And I got that handheld mirror out. I took a look to see what was going on down there. And I saw that bulge coming out of my vagina. And it was, a, it was about a, a walnut size bulge. It was, I was grade three of, of uh, five grades or four grades of severity. So I was pretty progressive on, on the scale. I had uh, three types of prolapse. I had a cystal seal, the bladder, I had a rectal seal, the rectum, and I had an enteral seal, large enteral seal, the intestines. And, and so I, I didn't know what it was. And I emailed my, lucky for me, my, best friend at that point in time was my practitioner. And so I emailed her and I said, what up? <laughs> you know, there's something going on down there. And she said, come on in, we'll do a public exam. And so I went for that exam and she examined me and she said, very matter of factly, Sherry, you have pelvic organ prolapse. I'll fit you for a pessary. If you're not happy with the pessary, I'll refer you to a, a good urogynecologist that I know. I had no clue what she was talking about. I had never heard of any of those terms before. And so I did what most women would do. I went home and I hit Dr. Google to see what was going on down there. She fit me for a pessary and she did a great job. On the first try, she got the right size and it fit well and it worked well. 
and I hit the Dr. Google, Google thing to find out what, what all of these terms meant. I started educating myself and I was furious. I was so angry. I could not believe after all the proactive stuff I had done with my health, that I had this condition that I not only had never heard of, but that it was so common. And at that point in time, this is going back to 2007 was when I was diagnosed. At that point in time, the stat that they used for prevalence was 3.3 million women in the US, which was insanely large number-wise at that point in time. And now they're saying 50% all the time. But uh, I just, I was, I was mad. I was just plain mad. And I, I just felt that if I didn't know about this, having been as proactive as I was, women didn't know about this. And so I knew within two weeks of that diagnosis, I had to do something to change the status quo. I just, it wasn't acceptable to me that, you know, there's, there's pink all over in October for breast cancer. And this isn't obviously a life altering condition, but it's a very life altering condition. I just couldn't get past the fact that nothing had been done to make us aware of this. So I don't know how I knew within those first two weeks that I had to change the dynamic. I just knew. So my first thought was, well, I should write a book about this and it'll get into the hands of women and it'll change women's health radically and they'll all know about it and it'll be great. I was so naive back then. <laughs> I was so right, naive. Right. So I set about uh, gathering information on prolapse, doing my research. And I also knew within a couple of weeks after I was diagnosed and was fitted for that pessary that that wasn't going to work for me. It worked well. I put it in every morning and every night I would take it out and wash it and leave it out at night and put it in the next morning, kind of like contacts, but 60 hour work week. I didn't have time for one more thing to do. So I contacted my doctor and I said, okay, what's next? <laughs> so she turned me on to the Euro guy and she talked about, and I made an appointment to go see her. So I was, I was diagnosed in early December and in mid January, I had the appointment with the urogynecologist and she was, she's amazing. I love her. She's just an awesome urogyn. And, and so I said, you know, here's, here's what I can share with you. And, you know, we've got Deb's nose. So what, what do we do now? She said, well, let me do an exam first. So she did the exam and she's the one that told me the grade of severity I was in. And she says, okay. She says, well, there's no rush to have surgery. She says, why don't we plan it this way? She says, why don't you figure on taking the summer off and you can, you know, weed the flower beds and spend some time outside, go for walks in the park, blah, blah, blah. And then at the end of summer, you come in and we'll do surgery. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Fix it yesterday. I want to get on the schedule. I just want to be back to my normal. So she's okay, if that's what you want, that's what we'll do. So she did the surgery. Plus I had three types that had to be repaired and the anterior seal, as, as I mentioned, the anterior seal was huge. It was a 12 week heel curve for me. So the good news is that in the prep time between when I was diagnosed and when I was on the table early February for surgery, I gathered all my information for the book. <coughs> then after I had the surgery and the first week was just couch time, that was it. I started digging into the, the writing part of the book and I got the book finished by the time my 12 week heel curve was up. So then in July, I was off looking for a publisher for the book. And, and then I found one in September, I believe it was. And October started that process of how they build books. I knew nothing about writing books. I was there and I'm, again, very naive. And I thought, easy peasy, just sit down and start typing. <laughs> And there's a lot more to it than that. So I, I, I went through the process and it took about a year for the book to come out. And I was about 15 months into marketing that first edition of the book. And actually the book, uh, it's one book, there's three editions of the book. It's Public Organ Prolapse, The Silent Epidemic. And it's just been refreshed and refreshed because so much has always changed in this space. So I had um, about 15 months into marketing the first edition light bulb came on. If you want to help women effectively support them, guide them effectively, you should fund a nonprofit. I knew nothing about the nonprofit sector. I had engaged in coaching Special Olympics basketball. 
that's my extent of knowledge in the nonprofit sector. So I had to find out about the structure itself and, and how you, you you build the entity and, and how you get federal does it because there's nonprofits that are not 501c3 and there's federally designated 501c3 nonprofits. So there's different ways you can go about it. I wanted the real deal because my vision was global from the get-go. It was never US, it wasn't Wisconsin, it wasn't US, it was global. This is women, all women. So I was fortunate that Marquette University here in Milwaukee has a, a pro bono program to help people that are building nonprofits do so. And they help you through the, the process of building the paperwork. And, and my app was 88 pages long. It, it was a very extensive application, but it passed through the first run. And so that established the nonprofit. And then I just kind of, it just, it kind of, the road showed itself to me as I needed it. I started taking a lot of classes at the nonprofit center of Milwaukee, which is now defunct, but at that point was a very active nonprofit educational platform. And I was down there, they used to joke, I should just get a job down there because I was down there all the time taking classes, learning what I needed to learn to do it the right way. And, and the women started to, they started finding us. We had, um, I was invited to join a forum that was based in the UK talking about prolapse. And at that point in time, when I was invited in, there was around 150 women in there. And after it grew to about 325 women, the woman that founded it, she asked me to be a help moderate that space. It was a closed Facebook space. She had asked me um, if I wanted to, to take over because she was, her prolapse was fixed and she just wanted to get on with her life and not engage with the space anymore. I said, sure, we'll just make it part of the nonprofit. And so we continued to grow in that space. And now we have got 15,000 plus women from 177 countries in that space. There's also a lot of clinicians in that space too, but they basically just observe, they don't comment. So what it turned into, the vision for that was women helping women. It's not, I mean, we certainly have a lot of tools on our website. There's videos, there's articles, there's PMPO sheets, um, there's some podcasts on there. Uh, YouTube video link, you know, is pretty extensive. But um, the goal of what we do is that closed patient support form. Women can come in there and they can post information about anything to do with prolapse. So whether they come in and they just observe, they just read posts, or they come in and they tell their story, or they come in and they ask their questions, what typically happens because these are women that are from mid-teens to end of life, it's women, basically women. And as you mentioned, women don't have to have a baby to have prolapse. We have got a, a significant sector of women who have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, that tissue integrity condition, that are in their teens, their mid-teens that have had prolapse. And they're terrified. They have, I mean, they're, they're, they're children. And so they don't know what to do. And so what happens is, is, is they come in and they'll post their question or anyone that comes in, they post their questions and they're surrounded by these subsectors of women. The women that are in their teens that have prolapse, the women that are in their twenties that think their sex life is over, the women in their their thirties to their fifties that are, that are going through a divorce and how is a man ever going to want me if I got this tissue bulging out of my vagina? Women that are in their sixties and, and more so in the 70s that are thinking about, I'm not using it down there anymore. Should I just have the vagina sewn shut? The needs are extremely variable. And so this space, when women come in and they post their question or their story or their information, they're surrounded with support. from Other women who have been there, done that. And most health spaces, what occurs is people come in and they find their health information and then they're out. They go on. Beautiful they thing. Here they stay. With us, they stay. And they pay it forward to other women. It, it's amazing. It's just so amazing. Sherry, it, it, if, I, if I'm a woman listening to this podcast and I'm finding a connection to what you're saying, how do I find the space? What's, what's the name of the page on your Facebook? If you Google, well, it's pelvic organ prolapse support.org. But if you Google APOPS, A-P-O-P-S, you'll get right to us. You'll get right to us. At the top of the home page, you'll find the words support forum in red letters. 
that is the link to request entry into, into that closed Facebook space. And once you click that link, what happens is, um, you know, they'll ask for your email or their, your Facebook link. Um, they will send, it will send you automatically three questions. We do screen aggressively in our space to assure that it's a secure environment. We don't allow any men in there except the, the gynecologist, the urogynecologist, the cosmetic gynecologist, urologist. They're allowed in this space and physical therapists are allowed in there too. Um, and they can be men. But otherwise, no men are allowed in there. And so we do screen all requests for entry. So if you just look for those words, you Google APOPs, you look for the words, red letters, support form, that is the link portal to request entry into that closed support space. But if you take the time to look around the web space itself, you'll find a ton of information. Just going to the, the um, there's the video page, there's a POP Info drop-down menu with a lot, a lot of articles. There's um, Cherry Palm articles. I've been writing articles, articles for many, many years now. And so there's a collection of articles that section of the website as well. So you just look around. Uh, there's a practitioner locator page on the website. Lots of different things you can, you can be around into and find the information that you need. Amazing, Sherry. You know, there's a company out there that does something similar to Empower Women called Hister Sisters, which I know you've heard of. Um, and, and the only reason I bring it up, Sherry, is because Hister Sisters, it's made its way to the common GYN office throughout the United States. And a, a lot of people will actually, or a lot of patients will find them prior to having a hysterectomy and get a lot of valuable information that they'll bring back to me. We, you know, it's, it saddens me that there's definitely a disconnect between uh, the practitioners and the patients in discussing pelvic organ prolapse. It's one of these things that's sort of taboo. Uh, matter of fact, we, you don't see any celebrities endorsing uh, pelvic organ prolapse. Based them. And I <laughs> yeah, and, I, and it doesn't make any sense to me because you, you would bring such awareness to so many millions of women out there. Um, so have you spoken to the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology? Have you had your voice heard there? Um, there are, I, I'm just curious. There are, are many, ACOG's a pretty, that's a pretty firm wall to break through. And I do know many people at ACOG on the inside. And in fact, there's one of them that's one of the likes, uh, we've got a separate uh, APOPS Facebook page. Um, and she's frequently liking things I post on there, but I have not found them user friendly. It, it's I don't understand. I mean, they 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 all say things about um, you know that they're being proactive about prolapse, but they're not. They're not, and and it it really is frustrating to me that there's such a lack of diagnostic clinician and gynecologic clinician curriculum about POP. I. I pulled a bunch of books out of the Market Medical Library years ago to see what was in there for prolapse. And believe me, it falls far short. And, and how can they, I, I can't begin to express how often women in our space will say to me that they've gone to the gynecologist knowing that they have prolapse. And they did, did the handheld mirror check the whole nine yards. We have that POP risk factor questionnaire on our website. They've gone down there. They have half the symptoms on that questionnaire. And they go to their gynae and they say, I think I've got prolapse and they'll have them get on the table and they do a public exam and they'll say, yes, you do, but not that bad. So just, you know, do your kegels and you'll be fine. And that's not the right thing to say. So we tell those women to demand to be screened standing up. And typically what the gynees will say is, hmm, now I see what you're talking about. There's a huge gap in the curriculum that has to be addressed. It has to be addressed. And, and I have not found ACOG to be user friendly to their gynecologists, to their, their own people, or to patients. They had, here's an, a prime example, they had on their website at one point a series of animated videos showing, they were just 2D, but still they were animated videos showing prolapse organs in their normal position and then rolling to prolapse positions. I think there was only three types, but still they were on there. And, and I thought they were wonderful. And I used to uh, refer women to them 
So they could actually see that progression, how those organs slide down, and then they block them from public viewing. So I, I, I just, I couldn't imagine why they would do that. It's like, that's a valuable tool for women. So I, I just, I, I don't, I mean, I don't want to bad mouth anybody, but I just, I think they're, they're shooting themselves in the foot. They're not being proactive about this. Yeah. We're not talking I, about it out loud effectively. Yeah, unfortunately, I think that there's so much work that needs to still be done in this arena. And so for the time, for the sake of time, I'm going to let the audience know that there is absolutely a wealth of information on your website, which I've been to and searched and watched a bunch of your videos. And I was really impressed and myself, to be honest, learned a lot. Um, and so even as a physician, we always have to remember that Learning is the key to life, and, 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 and when you, pre you present it in such a way that really makes it simplistic and, and easy to understand, because, you know, pelvic organ prolapse can be confusing even for many physicians, to be honest with you. It's, it's unfortunately one of the weaker areas in many residencies as far as teaching and diagnosing, um, and, there's, and, and a lot of the treatments that conventional gynecologists use, in my opinion, is really outdated. And, and unfortunately, probably from 30 years ago when they were doing their training. And there's so many new technologies that are non-surgical that we can spend, and you and I will spend another podcast discussing treatment options. This was really to bring more awareness to the audience about prolapse and, and that it does exist. It's okay to talk about it. It's a must to talk about it. And I wanted to be able to send you guys to a website full of information and hopefully they can join your forums and have an, another arena to, to freely speak and be heard and to be helped. So I, I want to thank you, Sherry, for being on this podcast, because I think uh, what you're doing is not an easy thing that it's not you're not doing it, obviously, for financial gains. You're really doing it because you care and you're trying to change the way we, 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 we view things in our own sexuality, because this does affect women intimately. A lot of them are afraid to become Here's intimate. Um, so they go hand in hand. Anyway, Sherry, any last words you want to say to the audience before we wrap this up? And how do we find you again? Okay, well, I, the, a final thought for, for your audience is just for the women, no, you're not alone. 50% of women have this. You just need to find the answers for your individual needs because they vary from person to person. So, so there's hope. There's always hope, and and we see women always getting better and moving forward with their lives every day, and that's going to be the case for you. To find us, the easiest way to find us is to just Google APOPS. A P O P S. That stands for the Association for Pelvic Organ Prolapse Support. And once you Google APOPS, the links will come up and you click on a link. And if you're interested in joining our forum, you can look for the words in red letters, capital red letters, support form toward the top of the home page. That is a portal to request entry into our closed Facebook support group. And it takes up to a week to get in sometimes because there's usually quite a few women that are waiting to get screened <laughs> to get in. So um, it's a secure environment and you can talk about your concerns and questions knowing that it's a secure space to be in. So uh, lots of other information on our website. Dig in, find the answers for yourself, and know you're not alone. We do well, care. Thank you, Sherry, and, and I'm sure the audience have really appreciated listening to this podcast. I know you and I will, will be doing some follow-up podcasts together, so everybody stay tuned and look out for Sherry. Um, and please visit her, her website, because I think you'll find it very useful. I thank you, Sherry, for being a proactive um, patient advocate um, internationally and not just in the United States. And I wish there were a lot more women like you helping other women feel empowered. So, we're getting there. Women behind our space are getting loud and strong. So it's all coming. And thank I you so it. much for allowing me to be on your podcast to share this information, Dr. Gossip. Oh, uh, you're so welcome.